So very good morning to all of you. Thank you for joining us on a Sunday morning here in India. But thank you for joining from different parts of the world. We're so happy that you could join us. And uh, today, Heritage Hour is a very special one because the Museum of Christian Art completes 30 years on the 23rd of January, 2024. And as we complete these 30 glorious years, who better than our Vice President of the Managing Committee, Mr. Nascimento D'Souza, uh, to share with us stories that reflect on the last 30 years of the museum. Uh, most of us know Mr. Nasi, as we call him, and he's been on the Managing Committee with us uh, for many years. And, but a brief introduction for those of us who are, uh, who know Mr. Nasi, maybe in the recent past, but don't know him from many years. So Mr. Nasi D'Souza is the Vice President of the Museum's Managing Committee, a member of MOCA since its establishment in Rashal. He's a key figure in the museum's modernization and upgrade. He has also served as the chairman and committee member on several prestigious boards a highly active nonagenarian, having now retired from all commercial activity, Mr. Nasi, as he's affectionately known, is involved in all aspects of the museum and is a leading visionary. Before I start or I hand over to Mr. Nasi, I request you all to turn off or mute your audios. Uh, you are free to keep your videos on if you would choose to. And uh, if you have questions during the session that you would like to ask, please drop them in the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we will take up all your questions. And if time permits, you can even ask your questions, uh, you know, directly to Mr. Nasi. So with that, uh, I'll just open the presentation. Give me a minute. A very good morning to you all. I, I noticed that, that some of you, for some of you, it's evening. So good evening to you all, too. Friends, as you just heard, we're meeting today to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Museum of Christian Arts opening to the public in Rashal on the 23rd of January, 1994. 30 glorious years. That's what she said. Yes, 30 glorious years, but there were some difficult years too, as you will hear from me later on. Most importantly, it was a long cherished dream that had come true. And before I take you on Mocha's journey from that day to the present, perhaps, and perhaps also offer you a glimpse of the museum's likely future, I propose to take you back to over half a century ago, when the journey actually began. Goa, as you know, abounds in many Christian art museums, in churches, in convents, and also in private homes, as you can see on the screen. And excellent examples are the St. Cathedral, the Basilica of Paul Jesus, the Church of Santa Monica, here where we are located. Some of these churches and convents, besides being considerable historic and architectural interest, were also repositories of exquisite and priceless works of, of art in gold and silver, ivory, wood, themselves, representing the arts and culture of several centuries earlier. And therefore, these items are of immense antiquity value too. 
What made these objects extra special is that they were crafted by local, many of these objects were crafted by local artisans who consciously or unconsciously included local decorative elements in these religious Christian objects, thereby creating a new and unique art form, a symbiosis of Indian and European art and culture, now recognized globally as Indo-Portuguese art. On the screen here, you can see cabinets with lagas and laginas faces, chalices with bells, very Indian looking. Sadly, over the years, little has been done to document and record this artistic wealth. Also, much of these priceless works of art were in dire need of restoration and conversation, conservation. Sadly, as you all know, this situation exists to some extent even today. Further, a most disturbing aspect, and I think this is the most important part, was that some of this artistic wealth was disappearing from Goa and finding its way into homes of private art collectors in India and abroad. I've used the word some, but I think uh, from the information I have, or information available, a lot more has disappeared from Goa. Something had to be done. We had to stop, stem the rot. And the only way really was a museum. Anyway, this was a matter of concern. The disappearance of objects in Goa was a matter of concern, not only to art lovers in Goa, but also all those who wished to preserve for posterity was rich artistic wealth and its rich cultural heritage. In 1971, now that's what, uh, 40 years ago, no, sorry, 50 years ago, a, a group spearheaded by Annie D'Souza, wife of architect Wally D'Souza and Cecilia Menezes, the house of Menezes, and others shared their concern with Father Lucio Vega Cotino, who was then the director of the Pastoral Institute of Goa. So with the intention of setting up a museum and with the blessings and support of Father Lucio, the group, the group started collecting art objects from parishes, from churches, from convents, from private homes, and storing these items in the Pastoral Institute. They had made much headway, but sadly, with Annie D'Souza's departure from Goa and relocation to her permanently to the UK, the venture sadly went into a total lull. This was a sad part. It was only 10 years later, some, there was some consciousness again and some movement um, in 1981, Mr. P. P. Shurivka, a prominent Goan author, the first speaker of the Legislative Assembly of Goa. And at that time, he was the direct director of archives of the government of Goa. In a letter to the Archbishop of Goa, Mosito Raul Gonsalves, he expressed his great concern and pain over the deterioration of various objects particularly the frescoes and paintings in many of churches. The Archbishop, you know, conscious of the fact that this was, this complaint made by the, Mr. Shirodka was one of the many that had, he had received earlier from many like-minded people in Goa. And so he decided that at that stage, to, to you know, he got interested in helping out people, any venture that would be willing to start up conservation and preservation ventures. But he also talked about setting up a commission 
to start uh, to study the conservation of churches, art, on, art objects, and to suggest ways of preventing that damage and pilfering. Not so long later, in 1986, INTAC, the International Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, through its convener at the time, the convener of the board chapter, Baman Sardisai, who, as you probably know, later became was ambassador, Indian ambassador to Angola, he wrote to the Archbishop proposing the setting up of the museum in the precinct of the Raoul Shem, Rashford Seminary in collaboration with the Kaluska Kulbenkin Foundation. Now, it was really Mario Miranda, an active member of INTAC, and a passionate lover of Goa, who was really instrumental. He was among those who were greatly concerned about the disappearance of Goa's treasure. And it is he who was responsible for reviving the total museum project proposal and further with his contacts with the Gulbenkian Foundation, he got them also interested in funding such a project. Gulbenkian themselves were at that time looking around for the possibility of getting involved with the venture to safeguard Indo-Portuguese art. So, work on setting up the museum commenced really. There was an interval here, uh, not only in my talk, but there was an interval here uh, where the, uh, there was a lot of discussion of where to house the, uh, what part of the seminary to house the museum. Um, after much discussion, it was agreed that the Camarata that is a building that was detached from the church and the seminary, and later designed, designated as the dormitory for the seminarians, be assigned to the museum. I will come to it later again. But the arduous task of collecting appropriate objects for various churches and convents had begun at that stage and also the documentation and the agreements, the loan agreement. Father Tony de Souza was assigned the task of preparing a complete inventory of all the art objects. And it was in 1993 that the final selection of the objects was undertaken. Now this was done by, by Maria Helena Mendes Pinto of the Caliste Gulbenkian. Uh, she was an expert on Indo-Portuguese art, and it was she to whom all credit has, has to be given for the final selection of objects. These had to be, she sifted through these hundreds of objects that were placed before her, uh, studying each one minutely and deciding which met her general theme. You know, the theme really, the Indian contribution to Christian art. So earlier in 1992, the Museum of Christian Art was registered as an art society, as a society, and soon thereafter, the managing committee appointed. So with all the work with the final selection and the museum um, premises ready, the red letter day of the Museum of Christian Art had finally arrived, and a dream had become a reality. With great fanfare, the museum was declared open on the 23rd of 1990, January 1994, as I mentioned earlier, by the then President of India, Sri Shankar Dayal Sharma, in the presence of a host of Portuguese and Indian dignitaries and many other well wishers. In the museum, which you will see on the screen, the beautifully carved cast iron showcases blended beautifully with the Gothic windows of the Camarata, exuding old world charm. The unique and exquisite 
collection of engine inspired pieces are objects made by made a most favorable impression with all those who were able to come and see it. Judging from the various um, comments in the visitors' book, everyone thought very highly of the museum. Uh, among them was Sir Mark Tully, who was BBC representative in Delhi at the time. And on the screen, I think you will see his original letter where he said, what a magnificent exhibition. This should be must for all visitors to go up. I agree, but a must, yes. But where were the droves of visitors? The beauty was magnificent. So was the church and seminary in the precinct of which it was housed. Rashad was a beautiful place. The seminary was as a museum in, in itself. But Rashad was not on the tourist circuit, unfortunately. And transport connectivity with the rest of Goa was exceedingly poor. This is largely so to this day, as you probably know, you require even today, if you were somebody one needed to go to visit Rashad from Patrick, you needed three buses. Only those who had their own transport were able to get there. So the museum had very few visitors and consequently very poor revenue. Now I'll digress for just a little bit. I, mean, it, I mentioned earlier that the setting up of the museum was funded by the Columbus World Banking Foundation. Yes, this was a very large extent. Intake also had a part to play. They, they contributed some about. But the financial involvement of Wilbanken and Intact was confined, it was limited really to the setting up of the museum. Thereafter, the responsibility of operating and maintaining the museum rested solely with the museum society, and rightly so. So earlier, in order to this was this was understood. So earlier, in order to create a cause, a fundraising group was formed. This group, then Amigos Rorato, was headed by Mal Munka, who before his retirement to Goa owned a leading ad advertising agency in Bombay, and his reach, his connections with the corporate world was quite extensive. Fund collection was in the form of donations to a page in the catalog. I think the catalog cover is on the cover. Can we see him? A catalog of all the museum's objects. And when this catalog was actually printed, and the final accounts paid. The net amount that was offered to the museum sadly fell far short of expectation. So the museum commenced with a very meager opus. So back to my story of the museum. And so with low revenues and a meager corpus, the museum was literally forced to run on a shoestring. Very few visitors, therefore very few, very low ticket sales, income from ticket sales. In fact, very on most days, the revenue through shop sales exceeded considerably the ticket sales. But what was, what was necessary was perseverance to keep this important project alive. And that was done. I'm proud to say the museum's objects and premises continued to be well maintained. And the museum opened to the public all seven days a week. Now, thanks to a staff of three underpaid employees, 
but totally dedicated to the cause. And thanks to them, the museum, the upkeep, they never, never ever suffered. It looked the same five years later as it did on the day we opened it. Now, also sadly, you know, relocating the museum, a proposal that was mooted earlier, was not considered a favorable option by the Bending Foundation at the time, presumably because of their investment in the Lord. Providentially, providentially, five years later, the museum was forced to vacate the premises and forced to relocate as the seminarians were in great need of the Kamarata, the building housing the museum. And I said earlier, it was designated as a dormitory. The museum was now presented the opportunity to relocate to an area frequented in large numbers by local population and by well-wishers and by the many visitors to Goa. The location selected and the only space uh, offered to the museum by the arts diocese, it was the only space available, it was a section of the church of the convent of Santa Monica in the vicinity of the World Heritage Monuments of Enor Goa and right on top of the Holy Hill where other heritage one structures are located. The museum couldn't have found a better place. But, it's always a but, the premises, the only premises, as I said, available and on offer was the choir area of the Church of Santa Monica, which had long since been in disuse and in total despair. Disrepair, sorry. The section this particular section had a wooden floor, upper floor, supported on masonry pillars and assessed from the convent by the trusted nuns. But the wooden floor had long since collapsed. In fact, at the time we looked at it, there were no traces of wood. It, it had all rotted and disintegrated fully. This, this, this particular area was inhabited by hundreds of, of pigeons. I'm trying to describe, give you a picture of what the place looked like. You didn't know where the jungle ended and where the building commenced. It, it was one big jungle. It was, a, it was a section that was completely dark. This, this associates with the rest of the building. It's kind of, it was, nobody ever went into that area. So that was the part that was offered to the museum. And that was the part we gladly took. So transforming the premises and the surrounding area into a space suitable for a museum was quite a challenge. I remember people who were in the know that the museum was going to be transferred raise their eyebrows. That place? That place for a museum? Well, anyway, fortunately for us, architect Raleigh de Sousa, one of those leading architects, not only willingly accepted the challenge, but also generously donated his services to the museum. So he, along with Sylvester, engineer Sylvester de Souza, also a noted structural engineer, and members of the managing committee embarked on the daunting task it was facing them. To the team's credit, it must be said that in less than a year, they had brought about a total transformation, not only of the premises and its surrounding area, but also created the courtyard, which you 
when you feel it's now a very attractive part of the museum. Had you seen it earlier, it was part of a totally inaccessible jungle. So Boca now had a new home. So on 23rd of January, years later, exact to the day, 2002, once again, with much fanfare, the museum was declared open to the public. But the then governor of Goa, Sri Mahmoud Fazl, who's, who you can see in the picture, in the screen, and in the presence of Rosijo Rao Gonsalves, Archbishop of Goa, and the then Chief Minister of Goa, Sri Manohar Parika, who you can also see in the picture. It was on this occasion that the Chief Minister, Sri Manohar Parika, pledged the government of Goa's support to the museum in the form of a grant towards the cost of security. He declared that it was the government's responsibility to safeguard the museum's priceless treasures for posterity. And once again, the museum was a hit. The footfalls, as we anticipated, increased vastly. Favorable comments about the museum's unique collection, the manner of display, the idyllic setting continued unabated. The music attracted curators from all over the world, research scholars, Indian and international dignitaries, including heads of state. The relocation project was funded largely by the archdiocese and with donations from some Belvedere shares. But of events have to the museum where the services donated by PN writer and company, a reputed company of packers and movers, of whom special mention has to be made because they packed every single object from Rashmo, uh, which were in Rashmo, packed them and transported them to Old Goa. Not one item was damaged or missing. I have also to mention that whilst the premises of the government were getting ready, the museum's showcases and the objects were temporarily housed in the Archiepiscopal Palace, and it was open to display to the locals. Now, while a 450-year-old structure like Santa Monica has its beauty and charm, it necessitates constant attention involving substantial costs. Fortunately, again, I keep on going to use the word fortunately because we've had a lot of goodwill from all of us up to the museum. In this case, it was the Museum of Culture in New Delhi. They were one of our staunch supporters. And from some time to time, they announced, uh, they from time to time announced schemes of financial assistance to deserving museums. And we have been a recipient of their aid on several occasions. Now, on this particular occasion, we had a very big project involving the total repair of the roofs. We had problems with the roof, uh, water seepage, and uh, on the walls, but even through the tiles. And there was wood rot. So we decided to have the, whole, uh, the roof open. Now, this was a very providential move on our part, of the museum's part, because when we opened the uh, roof, we found three large beams. When I talk of it being large, you can see, if you look at the museum, over a foot deep, or nine inches, spanning the whole width of the museum. Well, three of these were hanging on by almost a thread 
just running through the wall. The, the wood had rotted, the wood over the wall had rotted almost right to the edge of the wall. And there was just about one inch keeping the, the beam up. The thought of had we not ventured on this project, the outcome could have been disastrous. When one thinks of it, if one gets good people. It was also during this period that another providential event took place. And that was a, a surprise visitor. It was the ambassador of Portugal to Delhi. He was he'd come to visit to see what was going on. And it was just by chance, because we were not thinking about it. I happened to arrive at precisely the moment when he was getting into the car. So I went up to him and I asked him, he was well suited in a chauffeur trip. Uh, I asked him if he really wanted to see the museum. Had he come to see the museum? He said, yes. I'm terribly disappointed because there was a pain. So I said, and then he proceeded to take out his card. Uh, and his card was the ambassador of Portugal to Delhi, Sijor Joachim Ferreira Marquis. I said, I'll see who you are. I'll take you in. He was very impressed with what we were doing. He was very impressed with museum's plans, because at that time, they planned to restore the Church of Santa Monica as well. And I must say, from that point onwards, any misgiving to the Benton Foundation might have had vanished, and we were back on back once again. So that was very providential as well. So following soon in November 2005, so his visit was followed almost immediately by a team from Gulbenkian Foundation, comprising of the newly appointed chairman, Sijor Melio Ruizela, a big friend of the Bureau of Down, Sijor Maria Elena Mendes Pinto, who I mentioned earlier, who had selected all the objects, and Sijor Job Pedro Carter. They visited the museum. They were impressed. They were impressed. They didn't expect to see the museum in the state it was. They were very impressed with the museum. But as uh, Tito Villa said, it was outdated. We needed to upgrade to current and world standards of museology and museography. He, he, at that time, mentioned that Wilbenton had taken a resolve not to embark on any, uh, on any funding, major funding of projects, but they would offer technical advice and help, financially help. Uh, so, uh, fund any such project. So he, he, he said he was firmly committed the Wilbenton Foundation to provide all technical help in the form of technicians, uh, architects, and whoever. It was also at that meeting that Sijor Ruivillar promised the Foundation's help to comprehensively train in Portugal at that cost the potential curator for the museum. This promise was kept. And about a, so, a year or so later, the museum was able to boast of having a well-qualified, superbly trained curator, none other than Natasha Fernandez, who's sitting here beside me. Mocha, I might say Mocha's great asset. So, and the upgradation project of this nature was estimated to cost around five crores. And it was left to Mocha to find donors to project, to fund the project. As I mentioned, Wilbenton had taken a resolution not to fund any large project, anyway, not, not particularly to India. 
naturally the project was relegated to the back burners where we were going to find five floors overnight. The foundation, but the foundation from time to time reassured us that well, if and when we embarked on the project, their help, technical help was forthcoming. Earlier I talked about, of course, artistic and architectural pressures being in great need of repair, restoration, and preservation. And as I said, these exist even today. One such pressure was none other than the Church of Santa Monica, right at, the, at our doorstep, a section of which we had already restored and now house Mocha. So this beautiful church, a state protected monument with its exquisite altars, miraculous crucifix, statues, paintings, and art objects, was in despair and desperate need of repair and restoration. Boca sought the technical financial technical assistance of both leading conservation architect, Eta Kashlanka, or of Pablido, and two internationally recognized art restorers, the late Miguel Matias and Joseph Estrada. Okay, these are these were well renowned restorers based in Portugal and done a lot of work in Mexico and, and, and in Europe. So these were entrusted the job to carry out an in-depth study of, of the state the, the church was in and its various altars, etc., and to draw up a comprehensive restoration project. They did that. This was pre presented to the state government and fortunately, the state government approved the project proposal and provided a grant of 1.3 crores in two phases. The work was entrusted to this conservation architect and the two experts, and of course, the teams that went with them. Restoration work on the building those who knew and visited the Church of Santa Monica before will know the extent of work that had to be done and, yeah, and, and the difference after the work was done. Anyway, restoration work on the building involved completely, complete removal of all the cement plaster internally and externally. Now, you probably know the size of the building. This was a massive, massive job. And this plaster was replaced by mud, the original lime and mud plaster. So one can just imagine the, the quantum of work that was involved here. The removal of the red cement flooring revealed the original stone storage. Now, this is, again, a very special stone, which is not available generally. It's only available in one particular location in India, in, in Basin. We tried to get to replacements, find replacements locally, and we couldn't find. Um, on removal of the very ornate wooden pulpit, we found the original beautiful, Beautifully carved stone pulpit and the surrounds graffiti. At that time, at some stage, there must have been problems with the wall and it was filled, and therefore the new pulpit, wooden pulpit, with the steps leading up externally. But before, there were, the entry to the pulpit was through the wall. There was an entrance to the left of the screen that you see. You see the pulpit. To the left was an entrance to the screen that went up. You can see the opening to the pulpit. The altars needed extensive repairs because uh, 
through the ingress of water and also attacked by by termites. Much of the woodwork had had needed attention and replacement and needed a lot of attention. So also the statues and paintings all needed. But after a lot of efforts and time, when I talk of effort, I, I'll give you a, you know work on the on the miraculous cross. That was being held with but yes, almost like Michael Angelo on his lying on his back for hours painstaking painstakingly working on the crucifix. The amount of effort, I, I don't know if much has been realized that for the, for the force about that was offered by way of the graph, a lot was achieved and a lot was achieved because people were very dedicated. The money was not the question. They were dedicated to the cause, this important cause of the story, this beautiful and, and in no time, this beautiful church was restored to its former glory. And for which I can say, Moka can take credit. The church is now the venue of sacred art concert, music concerts and temporary art exhibitions organized by Boca. So I'm getting back now to our project, upgradation project. Resulting from a meeting in, in Lisbon in 2000, somewhere around 2014, early 2014, uh, a team from the Goodman Foundation uh, of experts visited the museum to assess the, the extent of work that had to be carried out to upgrade the museum to the proposed standards. The team's plan was presented in Goa in June 2015. And providentially, now I'm using this word again and again, because there is a power that has been supporting us. Providentially, in the same year, the Ministry of Culture, New Delhi, announced a scheme of financial assistance to important museum, museums needing to upgrade or expand and involving capital expenditure in excess of four crores. Needless to say, Moka seized the opportunity and submitted a detailed project report to the Ministry of Culture. I must say, the report, the likes of which I don't think they have ever seen, it was a mass, it was a massive effort. It was a result of a massive effort by. A, a team of not only Will Benken, comprising Sijon Maria Fernanda Matthias, and architect Rita Albergrier, conservators from Intec, New Delhi, working alongside architect Armidio Ibero, the museum's project consultant, and the museum's project team. The museum's proposal was accepted by the ministry in 2017. The grant was sanctioned. But, in the but, before the ministry confirmed the grant, it sought the museum's confirmation in writing that it would fully fund its share of the project cost. Now, at that share, at that time when the project proposal was made, we were conscious that we couldn't go very much above four crores, knowing the limit of the grant that was available. So at that, the project cost estimated at that time was 5.35 crores. Towards which, I'd say, as I said, the building and the museum the ministry was willing to contribute four crores. The museum had to find 1.35 crores. It didn't have much in the kitty at that time. So, but whilst, whilst, whilst the uh, Moka was awaiting the Ministry of Culture's final response, we had an indication that we were a favored museum. 
So we we started work on looking around of where we could find 1.35 crores. And much of the work was done, uh, project, <laughs> hunting was done in Portugal at that stage. Um, so we met the Minister, Ministry of Culture in Portugal, uh, amongst others, the, uh, but fortunately for the museum, again, and the music, the word fortunately, the Minister of Culture happened to be an old friend, Sir Luis Philip Castro Mendes, who was earlier ambassador of Portugal to India and had visited the museum several times earlier. He also later, while this project proposal was being considered, he accompanied, and I think his selection was delivered, he accompanied the, the Prime Minister on his state visit. And during that time, the Minister visited the museum once again, you know, to see for himself what was necessary. So I won't go into any more details here, but before long, and to the museum's great delight, between the Gulbenkian Foundation, who, who had then changed their opinion about funding, as, as a special case, the Ministry of Culture and a, a donor, who's a, a great friend of the museum, the Signora Teresa Mendia, Mendia de Castro, who's the descendant of the last Earl of Nova Corps. And she'd be the big friend and, and a, a very prominent um, piece in the museum donated by her. But between the three of them, they offered to donate 1.35 crores. And we were off. Heaven was on our side. So, mind you, the, the project cost finally escalated to around seven and a half crores for various reasons. One is to design changes to meet these high standards that we set, um, cost aspiration locally and, and the foreign exchange. Uh, but the total cost was, was justified. And this stuff, incidentally, this additional two crores was met for funds from very close good friends of the museum. Uh, and thanks to them, we were able to achieve what we set out to do. So full credit to them for, and, and thanks for their support. Because the uh, showcases, there's a very special showcases, which were designed in Germany and manufactured by that plant in Slovenia. The lighting designed and manufactured in it. The flooring was extra special. As you can see, something that was newly introduced to India. So, all in all, I can say that additional cost was justified because, once again, the museum had a, an absolutely new look and was open to the public. End of journey? Certainly not. As I said, museum will never remain static and it has plans the lower. And what are these plans? Well, I've talked again and again about art objects in India, not, not necessarily confined to religious art or Christian art. There's art galore in all this requires restoration and conservation. So we're talking for restoration and conservation center. Uh, additional exhibition space. Now, the Archbishop is Rao has, has promised us additional space. We could have galleries to exhibit again works of art not confined to religious Christian art. There's a lot of art in Goa, but paintings, tapestries, sculptures, wood carved wooden furniture, much else, and a library and archives. But as always, the support of you, Mocha's well wishers, is vital. If Mocha is to convert these dreams, these are dreams, and one must must dream to 
if we have to convert these dreams into reality. Finally, in closing, I take this opportunity on behalf of all the present members of MOCA to thank the many, very many, who over the years have been associated with this prestigious institu institution, either as members of the Managing Committee or staff, or on its many projects, large and small. And most importantly, all those of you who are listening, but and who have supported MOCA through all these years, a big thank you to you all. Thank you so much, Mr. Nasi, uh, for taking us on this wonderful journey of MOCA over 30 years, highlighting the high points, the not so high points as well, and uh, bringing us to where we are today and sharing some of our dreams for the future. Um, if we have questions, please, uh, maybe we can take them. Uh, directly. If you would like to unmute and ask a question, please let me know. Uh, Snehal here says, are all the objects in the museum from different countries and which countries? Snehal, I'll answer that question. Uh, all the objects or most of the objects are from churches in Goa and a few have a few and a growing collection now are from individuals who have donated objects, art objects uh, to the Museum of Christian Art. A few are from other states in Goa. I think we have a couple that have come from Kerala. Uh, but by and large, everything is from made, was locally crafted here in this in this space. Um, not brought from other countries. And if there are, there might be one or two which may have come as prototypes from Portugal or Italy right in the very beginning, maybe in the 16th century. Thank you. Uh, if anyone has a question for Mr. Nasi, uh, you can go ahead and uh, ask a question. Shaila says, kudos dad. Uh, Mr. Nasi's children are also on this uh, Zoom session. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you haven't fallen asleep. <laughs> Louis, <laughs> yes, Louis Miranda, thank you for joining us. Uh, you have unmuted. Yes, we can take your yes. question. So, no, I just want to know how have been the number of visitors to the museum, and are we happy with that? We're never happy, but you can take that. <laughs> we we will never ever be happy. The more, the better. We are looking for more visitors. Uh, sadly, sadly, you know, when we moved here, Louis. Uh, we thought, oh, we're going to have oh, part of the hordes that 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 come just a few hundred yards away from us. So we could divert some of them would come up here, but sadly that doesn't happen. Um, museums uh, are not on their <laughs> preferred uh, visit, shall I say. Um, so if we don't get as many as as we would like, but but we are getting substantially more than we have had. So so if we are looking at it that way, but we are doing everything possible to attract business here. And if anyone has any suggestions how we can improve, you know. Uh, or oh, how we can, what we can do to attract more people here, uh, they will be most welcome. Yeah, Vince. Yes, Vince. Uh, uh, so I was thinking at the at the uh, Church of uh, Bon Jesus, is there any like flyer or anything that tells people who come to that that there's a museum around the corner? At the moment, no, there is no flyer, but we are in discussions with the archdiocese to put up a, a sort of a standee, which is not a permanent board, but a standee, which 
because it's being a heritage monument and lots of movement, we can only request for flyers and standees to be erected. And that's what we are working on right now uh, to, to work with the uh, uh, Basilica, where, which gets a lot of visitors during season and any time of the year. Yeah. Right, right. Anyone else? I will read the comments that are coming in. Uh, Shaila, sorry, I missed the whole thing. Kudos to Dad, Natasha, and all Mocha supporters over all these years. There's Michelle Bambawale, who also says, fantastic. Uncle Nasi, such a great presentation to see the past and present. Looking forward to the future. Yes, we are all looking forward and need your support. Uh, Priya Fonseca says, Fabulous to hear about Mocha. Thank you, Uncle Nasi. Here, you are an inspiration and all the best to the entire museum team. Hope to visit again. Uh, Snehal, can we have a virtual Mocha tour? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, a, it's something that needs to be done. And uh, there is a possibility. We have been in discussions with some. And hopefully that can be a dream for the future and the near future. It is doable. So we will get back to you when it's virtually uh, available to do a mocha tour. Thank you, Michelle, for promoting your book and promoting mocha as well. Uh, yes, Louis, we will be in touch and uh, we'll count on your support to, to help us with the footfalls at mocha, increasing the footfalls at mocha. Yes. Anyone else has a question? We have a couple of minutes before we end the session. So if there's anything that any of you would like to share, it need not be a question. It could be something that you would like to share. Your visit to the museum in the past and what you feel about the, the works that have been done. Okay. All right. The walks have been educational. Thanks, Michelle. So uh, we have been uh, not only focusing on the museum as a space, but trying to grow the MOCA community, the people who come into the museum space uh, through various activities uh, and trying to get, get more visibility through our various activities. Like as we are doing this session right now uh, online, we have a simultaneous activity that's going on in the museum with children, a doodling uh, art activity. So you can see that the young community is also what we are focusing on, building the young community and their love for museums and heritage in Goa. Uh, we also conduct these heritage walks, which uh, highlight the Christian art in our various churches, the artistic and architectural heritage of Goa. So every month we do a different uh, location. This month we are going to Ribanda to look at the, the church there and a couple of chapels in the vicinity. Uh, Michelle has been a regular. More of you can join us whenever you are. You have the time. We do it once a month on the last Saturday of the month. And uh, somebody here says I was at the inaugural. Teresa Kulasso, thank you for joining us on today's session. Uh, you were at the inaugural at Rashol and uh, and have been visiting regularly. I've met you many times when you visited here. The chairlift is really an asset for visitors who cannot climb stairs. Thank you so much for your valuable feedback. It was a, a, a requirement that we needed to have in the, in the museum space because uh, accessibility for all is top priority. Uh, though we are a small museum with a relatively small collection, but a very unique collection, we want to make it accessible to all. So yes, the introduction of the chairlift was was very important to us. Miss um, Nancy, any closing comments that you would like to make before we end? No, no, I, I, we're looking for more and more supporters to this cause. You know, um, we we need to spread the gospel, as they say. Um, we are a good institution. There's a lot that can be done here. I mean, we, in this, when I talk about the future, we are not going to confine ourselves just to the beauty of Christian art or exhibiting just religious Christian objects. There's a lot of art here, and this is the this is where your help will be necessary in future. 
you know, the museum has to grow. It will grow. This will be one arm of the museum, but there's a lot else that can be done. The museum can be, has scope to, to grow. You know, just consider the, the art that is available in Goa. When you, every side you look, whether it is in sculpture, when it's with wood carving, tapestry, I mean, uh, uh, you know, everywhere I look, I see art. And now that art, which is sadly, so most people don't even know the value of that art. And that's what we want to try and do. What the museum is doing is creating consciousness of that art that is available. So let's let's move forward now and let's look and expand it and and let's try and throw in all the other art art that is available. Painting, there's a lot of painting. Let's preserve these for posterity. Thank you so much. And before we end the session, I'd like to inform you all, while we uh, celebrate 30 years this year, uh, we will be setting up an exhibition on the 30th of January in the Church of Santa Monica uh, on this journey of MOCA's 30 years, so right, right from our days in Russia to where we've come, uh, highlighting our uh, various achievements. Uh, over the years and we'd love you to come and visit this exhibition which will be on for a month we will share details with all of you um, through email and through whatsapp if you are on our events group and uh, do try and come and visit the exhibition do drop in to say hello uh, if we are not around on the museum floor we will definitely be in your museum office uh, let us know when you're coming and we'd be happy to interact and always wanting to to know different ways in which we can make more uh, make mocha um, you know known to more people and thank you for being our supporters over the years thanks once again and have a good sunday and a good week ahead thank you great job guys bye bye thank bye, you. All. bye bye thank you all thank you <laughs>